Aloha and welcome. I'd like to welcome you today with a Hawaiian chant that talks about the smell of certain fragrances that come to you and remind you of certain people. And then there you are. We welcome you with Aloha. Ai o nau nai ta hala me ta lehu ai E hale lehu ano i ana ta noe O ta uno ia e ano i nei e ali a nei O i o ta i ti mai Ai ti mai no o e Ai ti puno me te alo Aloha e Aloha e Aloha e Aloha and welcome. I'd like to welcome you today with a Hawaiian. Aloha, my kapo, everyone. And thank Aloha. you so much for joining us for the second episode of Return to the Source. And speaking of returning to the source, I'd like to take the time to mahalo. Kumu Hokulani Holt, uh, Hokulani Holt for providing us with that beautiful Ole Aloha, that chant to open the space and ground us and really set the tone for today's conversation. Kumu Hoku is someone who has devoted her life to perpetuating the teachings and uh, ways of our kupuna, our ancestors. And I'm just so thrilled that she actually said yes to doing to being a part of this uh, conversation today. And we'll see a little bit late, uh, later on another clip from her. So mahalo Kumu Hoku. And I suppose I should introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Aloha, my name is Moses. I am a Honolulu-based theater artist, although I am originally from the island of Maui. I am also a Kata board member, and I'm one of your co-hosts for today's show. And speaking of co-hosts, I'm going to hand it over to Leslie now to introduce herself. Huh. Mahalo, Moses. Thank you so much. And yes, mahalo to... Kumuhoku, beautiful blessing for us to start this program. I'm Leslie Ishii, Artistic Director of Perseverance Theater on Clinket Ani. So grateful to Clinket Ani, where I'm here. And uh, we also honor the Akakwan and Takakwan peoples, and also the Denaina peoples, where we also serve up in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. I'm currently on Clinket Ani in Juneau, Alaska. And as your new board president of the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists, I, on behalf of the entire board, welcome you to this second episode, to this space with us where we have incredible guests coming uh, to be in conversation. Uh, and this, this is actually the episode called Modeling Solidarity, Theater as Political Action. So with that, I, I hand it back to you, Moses to share a little bit about Kata. Yeah, a little bit about what we're doing right now. For those of you um, who don't know, uh, 20, Kata Confest 2020 was supposed to have taken place here in Hawaii, but for reasons that we all know, it had to be postponed, and now it will be happening in May, 20, um, May 2021. And we are remaining hopeful that it will, in fact, take place in May. Um, the dates are the 21st through the 30th, but of course, that that depends on the current state of our, our world in light of the, the pandemic. So we are hopeful that it will happen. But either way, we've decided to do this virtual series. So each month we'll be having an episode leading up to May so that when, just to keep the conversation going and keep the interest and, and momentum going so that when we're able to convene together, whenever that, that is, we'll be ready to have um, an amazing confest and really blow it out of the park and have a really big impact. And, to, and this is the second episode, Modeling Solidarity. Great, thank you, Moses. And just a little bit about our agenda this afternoon. Uh, as Moses mentioned, uh, 
We'll be sharing more about ComFest with you. We have a little bit about uh, what's up and coming. You see the slide there, why Hawaii, our partners, uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities will be partnering with them, amplifying the works produced in and by local Hawaii theater artists, developing, expanding the network of POC theater artists. So uh, Hawaii to Alaska, where I am, to the continent and throughout. So uh, we're excited about sharing more about that with you. And uh, the guests and the partners that um, have been with us, uh, those are our special, our esteemed guests today. Uh, Jonathan McCrory, Armando Wipe, and Makiile Ishihara. We look forward to introducing them to you, having a great conversation. And as uh, uh, Moses mentioned, a little bit more from our Kumu Hoku. And I'm also excited to share with you that we'll be seeing some work, some uh, short works from uh, Makiile. So with that, actually, shall we get started? Yeah, uh, Moses, I, I, I'll pass the baton back to you so you can introduce that first piece. Yeah, I have the pleasure of introducing our first guest, um, Ku'u Aloha, my dear friend and colleague and creative collaborator, Makile Ishihara, and we're going to bring her on in just a moment. But before we do, we'd like to share a, a piece from ADOC's mini documentary series that features Makile and some of the work that she has created. And right after that, we're going to bring her on. So enjoy the video. My name is Makiile Ishihara. I am a company actor at the Honolulu Theater for Youth. Mommy! Yes? Hello. Yes. Go to daddy. Can you hear me? The children are unpacking the whole thing and knowing that they can't see their friends. They're worried about this new virus. Give me 10 minutes. And I think that's the beautiful thing about art. What is our truth? How do we look at that and appreciate it and apply it to our lives? Let's play. Yay! Early media in COVID, when things were being associated with people of Asian descent, there was an uptick of hostility. And I'm like, this isn't the reality that I want. I grew up very Japanese. And then at the same time, I grew up very Hawaiian. Poi dog, I'm mixed up. That's fine. Poi dog. Yeah, that's me. My kind of poi dog and your kind of poi dog are made to be equal. Equal does not mean a simple game of same is same. A poi dog kind of equal means I'm a person, you're a person who deserves love and respect every day the same kind of way. I really hope that we can all gain an appreciation and a curiosity for others and expand it to connections and expand that to working together to make change that we want to see happen. So let's take care of one another. From Hawaii to the mainland, from Australia to Japan, from Egypt to Afghanistan, we're all in this together. We're Poi Dogs, hand in hand. Beautiful. Aloha, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. And Aloha, my kako. Oh, and your Ike. Um, you want to just take a moment to just talk about you and what you do. Aloha, my kako. My name is Makiile Ishihara. I am from Kaneohe on the island of Oahu. Uh, for myself, uh, born and raised, I was always around music and the arts. So that is very much something I carry on to my own ohana. And I have my own crazy, fun, modern ohana. We are a blended family of four. And so that journey has been quite uh, a beautiful one. And incorporating these aspects of solidarity, how we come together as our individual unit and carry on forward to our community, our kaiaulu, and reach out and work from there and radiate outwards to everyone. Mahalo. Mm. Mahalo, Louis. You know, when I was talking, when Leslie and I were, we're just talking about who to bring to this conversation, you know, with modeling solidarity, you were the first person that came to mind. I know you very well because you're a friend and I work closely with you and, and I just observe how you model solidarity with, with within your community and also within your ohana, being a mother and just a mm. leader. Mahalo, Louis. Mahalo, Louis. 
Beautiful. Welcome, Maki Ile, to this space. Thank you for being with us. Mahalo. Great. So with that, shall we continue to move? Yes. I want to set up just a little context as we introduce our next two guests. Uh, this is the Consortium of Asian American Theaters, our, our ComFest Conference Festival in 2016 that took place at Oregon Shakespeare. And here you'll see a photo where we had a flash mob and we just took over the street saying we're here. Our communities of color, our BIPOC communities are here. And, um, and then the festival was themed seismic shifts. So that was Kata's commitment to begin to include the MENA community, to begin to include our larger diaspora, Pan-Asian, uh, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian, Indigenous, and MENA communities, um, and to make sure that we were actually making the change that, that we wanted to make to go forward into the future. And so that photo was impactful because there was a, a historic photo that showed the KKK marching down their street in a parade in the 30s. So for us to do our flash mob uh, was a, a sign of change and it supported Oregon Shakespeare Festival, now Nataki Garrett running Oregon Shakespeare Festival to support their uh, racial equity initiative. So, and that was also the site and the time, the Confest, when we held our first think tank, Tim Dang and I received a national grant to start to look into and study what does it mean for sustainability for our communities, our BIPOC communities. And then if we can move to the next slide, we brought that energy forward into Chicago's Confest two, two years later, 2018. And next we committed further to change and that was Re uh, Revolutionary Acts, our sixth National Asian American Theater Conference. And I can share with you, Black Theater Commons was actually represented with Sade uh, Link up from uh, National Black Theater and in the first think tank and moving on to this confest, we began to then bring the other networks with us. We had indigenous, we had Latinx with us, but now our networks were starting to form and we held this confest, making sure we had revolutionary acts going on, which meant really committing to bringing art and activism together. We held the No Aloha Poke sessions to train ourselves as activists. And then you'll see in that upper corner there on the left, that's when we were protesting together in solidarity with our networks, with our uh, diaspora brought together at that confest. So we truly went out on the streets and we protested on behalf of the native Hawaiian community and their delegation came from Hawaii. And within the confest itself, we were able to actually center native Hawaiians. You'll see on the other side of the photo, uh, Tammy Haile Opua Baker, professor at University of Hawaii Manoa, gave the keynote. It's one of the few times I think I've ever seen a native Hawaiian, let alone a native indigenous, actually open a major conference and festival. It was really spectacular. And the, the opening ceremonies by the Potawatomi, Peoria, and the Miami uh, nations, welcoming the local native Hawaiian community, who then in turn called in the Native Hawaiian delegation from Hawaii. It was, it was a beautiful and moving ceremony to open up the contest. So with that, uh, again, we had a second think tank there where we brought the networks together. And uh, that has started us coming together as a national BIPOC um, work group coalition commons. And so that's a little bit of context for our guests on with us today. So. With that now, I would love to start to introduce our, um, our next guest who is, oh my gosh, this, his name is Jonathan McCrory, a two-time Obie award-winning artist. He's the Cranes New York Business 2020 notable LGBTQ leader. As a Harlem-based artist, he served as the artistic director uh, of National Black Theater since 2012. Uh, under the leadership of CEO Sade Lithcott, as I mentioned. And um, you're also a founding member of the producing organization, Harlem Nine, the Movement Theater Company. And you have served with or national organizations, again, the Advisory Committee for HowlRound uh, How Theater Commons, but also, as I mentioned, the Black Theater Commons. And then you are one of the first alumni of Art Equity 
Jonathan. It is such a pleasure to have you here. I feel you are family, friend, brother, cousin. I just have always, <laughs> since our beginning, I felt the synergy and the solidarity. So I it's think. such a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. It's a deep, deep pleasure. Yes. Would you like to say a few words uh, about your work and the network or being in solidarity? I, I mean, what, 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 I will, what I will say is that it's all stemming from, um, actually, I, I, I started to really start to realize, and COVID's really done this, of really looking at um, how is our work generating space for the passing of the torch? Um, not for this moment right now, but making sure that there's a future. And that future is creating access and creating possibilities for individuals that we might not know, but individuals that deserve a fighting chance, a more, uh, a more uh, equitable chance to dream uh, bigger than what we were able to do, dream more holistically than we were able to do. Um, so I will say that the bulk of my work um, and the bulk of the work in which I invest in from the Black Theater Commons to National Black Theater to X, Y, and Z is trying to really create a web for, um, for a future that we haven't imagined yet, but we can envision and begin to build. That's beautiful, thank you. Especially because we know our black pot community is widely known now. We've been disproportionately hit. So yes, absolutely necessary to dream forward and support our future generations. Thank you, and our current generations. Awesome. Oh my goodness, well, mahalo, welcome to our space. And with that, I know we'll be in deeper conversation in a few moments, but with that, <laughs> I'll pass the baton to you, Moses, to yes. introduce our next esteemed guest. Hey, yes, welcome, welcome, Jonathan, to our, our show here. And I'm gonna introduce our final, our third and final guest, uh, that is Armando Huipe. Armando is currently the producer of the National Latinx Theater Commons, but has also held many other titles. Armando was the managing director of Yale Cabaret, the assistant managing director of Yale Repertory Theater, the developmental associate at the Latino Theater Company in, um, Los Angeles and the founder of Latinx Theater Alliance in Los Angeles. Armando, aloha and welcome to Return to the Source. Hi, thank you for having me. We'd love for you just to share a little bit about yourself and the work that you do, the amazing work that you've done over the years. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I will share that uh, I'm, I'm calling in from the ancestral and unceded lands of the Tongva people, uh, now known as Boyle Heights. Uh, I'm the child of Mexican immigrants. And um, having been born and raised here in Los Angeles, I was so lucky and am so grateful to be a part of this Latinx theater making community here in Los Angeles and the greater LA theater making community. Um, and, you know, you just kind of keep taking it one step at a time. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Mahalo and welcome, welcome. Okay. so. Moving along, as promised, we are going to feature another video that Anti Akumo Hokulani Holt has made for us. And this video, just to give you an idea of, of, of um, why I asked her to do this, part of what we wanted to do with this conversation is show solidarity intergenerationally. And there was a, a movement that has that took place here in Hawaii that is still happening, and it happened on one of our, our sacred mountains, Mauna Kea. And that movement, as you'll you'll hear in uh, from Kumuhoku and her words that are coming up, was led by our kupuna, our our elders, and we followed their lead. And something truly amazing happened when when we allowed that to, to happen. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on Kumuhoku for her to share some of her mana. Aloha, my name is Hokulani Holt, and I am from Maui, Hawaii. It is my pleasure to share some thoughts about how intergenerational connectivity can bring solidarity in trying times. As a culture, we foster the idea of the collective benefit rather than the individual need. This, we before me, is evident in many aspects of Hawaiian culture. Because of this foundational outlook, the community is clear that we all must work together toward the common good. In Hawaiian culture, we have a strong belief in the wisdom of age. Not only that, but we are clear that our kupuna or elders have a primary desire for the entire community. Mm.
bear when the individual, the family, the community, and even the nation needs it. So this practice of the common good and respect for our kupuna teaches us that good Hawaiian leadership has knowledge, experience, and a desire for the common good of the community. Thus, kupuna wisdom is often sought inside and outside of the family during times of need. Our culture demands that when our kupuna lead us, we each must do our part. The mapua or parent generation put their best minds and action towards the solution. And the younger generation will add their strength and vitality to fulfill that solution. And all of this in the firm knowledge that it is for the benefit of the community as a whole. The interrelated appreciation and recognition that each person's contribution is valued. This solidarity in thought, understanding and action is what made the recent protective measures for Mauna Kea so remarkable. Our kapu aloha, or code of behavior, that is centered on aloha, was given by the kupuna. It tells us that we must show compassion, mercy, and affection for all, even in the hardest of times. During the nonviolent direct action responses to the building of the TMT telescope on Mauna Kea, this kapu aloha, led by our kupuna and exhibited by all those that participated, was a prime example of the power of aloha. It mm. was not a sign of weakness, but a demonstration of strength and resolve. People from around the world came and offered support because they saw and knew this was right. We, in turn, would do the same thing for them if kapu aloha is present. Hawaiian culture tells us that all members of the community are needed and valued. And mm. all thought and action for the collective well-being of the community is our primary goal. This is kupuna wisdom in action. Mahalo and aloha. Beautiful gratitude uh, and with the honor, Kumu Hoku. Yes, mm. thank you. Um, as we get started into our conversation and we um, come into our space here, uh, I just want to share that if we have technical difficulties, we just breathe and we know we can come through it. And if any one of us freezes, you might go off and come back so we know they'll be back with us. And then also, um, we just want to thank, of course, our viewers for tuning in once again and um, to, to have this important conversation and witness it with us. Um, so with that, uh, oh my goodness, the wisdom of Kumuhoku. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like each of you, as I get to know you, Maki'ile, and Moses, I've started to know you in different spaces. And Armando and Jonathan, I know you in different spaces. So I feel this beautiful synergy that uh, of a working group already. And some of you, we have been working um, for the, on behalf of our larger BIPOC communities, knowing that we it's becoming, I think, a widespread fact that we're under-resourced in the BIPOC theaters and practitioners communities throughout the American theater. So uh, our sustainability, we've been working towards that for some time now and getting stronger in how we work together in concert around that, which is what most call solidarity. So with that, I just want to open up our conversation to um, thinking of our viewers too, who, what does solidarity mean to you? Mm. It can mean different things. I don't want to assume it's the same thing to each one of us or to our communities. Um, I know we had a conversation, just so our viewers know, we had a conversation, of course, a meeting to get prepared for this, and we jumped right in and we were deep in. But I'll just back us out a little bit just to say, what about solidarity? 
it might have different meaning for different communities. I'll try. Please, great. Um, so when I when I think about solidarity, um, I think about the capacity of cultural, like cultural compassion. Um, how do we create the space for cultural compassion? Compassion that extends past, and cultural empathy actually. Um, something that extends past your knowledge of self. Something that actually allows for the heart to be in the center of your decision making. Um, and, and and we think about compassion. Compassion um, sometimes uh, 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 um, softens the modality of judgment. Um, of something that's foreign from yourself. So when I think about solidarity and I think about the space of building systemic solidarity that's healthy, and when I think about like what's happening in our communities and what's happening in the nation at large, I think about the missing heart chakra that is part that 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 is not necessarily put into the palpable space of actually addressing and giving birth and life to um, the decision making of how we could actually be building forward. So when I think of solidarity, I think about where's the cultural empathy? Where's the compassionate um, capacity that we are centering um, decision-making and the ability to create the olive branch uh, where we're not demonizing the other, we're welcoming the mm -hmm. other to actually um, be potentially the um, evolution that we've been waiting for. Um, because that's what it could actually mean to step into the potential shoes of someone else's um, desire or need could awaken your evolution. Um, and I think sometimes we think of evolution as a positive thing, but I've been really sitting with this notion and I will be quiet because I feel like I've talked too much already. No, but um, I, I've been sitting, with the, sitting with the capacity of like, I've been really sitting with a caterpillar. A caterpillar goes into a cocoon um, fully going through a process of being transformed, but inside of it, the essence of who they are stays true. The essence of who they are stays true while they're inside a cocoon, totally being broken, shifted, morphing into something else. And we would be remiss if when they came out of that cocoon, they, they left out as a caterpillar. There will be something that's remiss inside of that. So when I think about COVID-19 and I think about the way that we've been asked to like, shroud ourselves when i think about this moment of solidarity that's needed that is almost like a covering i ask myself how are you allowing for the possibility of, of transformation um to stretch the bones and the muscles that you knew as the caterpillar so that you could become the butterfly mm, beautiful wow thank you jonathan oh, what a great start mahalo anybody else want to yeah. add in yeah i think that um Leslie, you and I have been sharing a lot of space in, in terms of like Kata and LTC and this coalition that we're trying to, to build and, and hold space for. And, and uh, solidarity is among those words that keep coming up, networks, coalition, solidarity. And um, I'm thinking, yes, Jonathan, everything you, that you said, like put in action and the decision making is an active process and it must be informed by, by that empathy. And, um, and I think of in my work with the LTC, um, two, the, the diversity with, among Latinx cultures, um, our intersections with the Black community, with the Asian community and Indigenous communities, and how we're, we're really trying to like build ourselves as a coalition, as a movement, too. And, um, and all of that, it, it, the solidarity is so, just like so much more dynamic than, than whatever noun that it is. Um, that uh, it, that's its state of being is in dynamicism. And so mm. keep reminding myself that every action I take must be in solidarity with. And um, yeah, just like finding that space within yourself and uh, opening up that space and conversation whenever I can. Yeah, just to uh, tag on to what everyone has said, absolutely 10,000 times yes. And um, thinking about this, this compassion and this grace afforded to each other mm. as if we were all part of this collective family. And I know in Hawaii we say ohana, and the tagline is ohana means family. Family means no one gets left behind. But for us, it's something even bigger than that. And there's a sense of responsibility. There's that accountability because... When you're on, at least for us here in Hawaii, we're on an island. We all we've got. 
and mm. it should be the same, even mm. the continents. That's a bigger one, but you're all you've got. And these, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this connection and this pilina is so important. And from my own personal journey with this blended family, anyone coming from a blended family can tell you there's a lot of growing pains with that. And from my Hanai daughter, she's Latinx and she's Puerto Rican and Portuguese and Filipino. And so when here comes this, you know, Hawaiian coming into her life, telling her, hey, let's go to these um, protests or let's go to these sit in functions for conversation. And she's like, well, I don't have anything to, you know, where is my place in it? Because I'm not Hawaiian and I Hanai her and Hanai is just is so much more than adoption or caring for or being a steward of. It's really taking this person in and she is now a part of me and a part of the line of which we come from. Mm -hmm. And so saying, and looking at our community in that realm where, and how Jonathan had so beautifully said, the olive branch, and it's really building that out to where you were hey. calling in people and not demonizing, not having to say, well, you, you know, you or scolding. It's really calling in in love because as, as a, as that figurative step parent, right? Step mom, I got to really find a way to adjust and navigate and grow together with this new person and, and grow that relationship. And that's the kind of method we want to do in our community when it comes to solidarity, when it comes to these issues where we want to be as a collective instead of just, oh, well, I have, we have our, as this community, we have these grievances and we have these grievances. What are the connecting fibers and the interconnective tissues that will really link us together? And yeah. how do I support you? How do I support my 14-year-old Hanai girl as, okay. you know, a 30-year-old? And so how do I support my community as an individual and then as a part of the whole? So it's a very convoluted explanation, but I'm hoping that it really resonates with all of us who have that family fiber and not just, it's so easy to get wrapped up in and fed up with, oh, I'm tired of being patient. I'm tired of being this. I'm tired of seeing all of this injustice and despairing like huge gaps where we just get the, the little end of the stick. And how do we reach out and make those branches for each other? I would really love to see that coming up in conversation and coming up in systemic progress for all of us. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, I see you have a thought. Well, what's, that, what's so powerful and so beautiful about what's being expressed is that this idea of calling in, this idea of bringing in, because that's intimacy, right? Intimacy is is a is a space that makes us like get soft in our heart chakra, a space in our like at the at the end of the day, if you're not solid, if you're not in solid connection with your own heart, how can you ever extend the capacity of being in relationship with someone else's heart? And I think right. solidarity is allowing for us to grow from a heart space. So like the idea of calling yourself in is also having a conversation to the places that like you might be contributing to the mess. And are you willing to have a conversation with the spaces that you might actually be contributing to the mess? Like I've had to sit with myself and say, hey, yo, Jonathan, how have you been contributing to doing anti-blackness work? If I'm not willing to have that conversation, how can I ever create solidarity with even my own community? And then also create solidarity with myself. Because if I don't have solidarity with myself, how can I ever extend that definition to anyone else? If I don't begin to love the spaces of my own existence, how can I ever have a conversation? I think because, because that intimate space that you shared so beautifully with your, with your daughter is a space of intimacy that then you get to replicate on a, larger, on a larger scale. But because it's because of that soul cocoon work, that, like, that inner work, that inner playful work. If you're not able to have that inner playful work, how can you ever have the conversation of creating massive change? It's the granular work. And I think sometimes we get lost in, in trying to create the solutions of comfort and not the solutions that actually are systemic and need to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm also, I'm reminded of at the beginning, at the outset of the LTC and our founding convening, uh, in our opening ceremonies, we read the poem uh, in La Kesh, this, this um, Nahuatl Aztec idea of uh, you are my other me. And uh, when mm -hmm. I when uh, I love you, I love myself. And when I harm you, I harm myself. And that, yes. Well, that's interesting because that's to me speaks to um, to all of your points. We I think get fragmented 
because of the internalized oppression that you know that comes in from the historical trauma we carry we know that from dna research now that the dna messaging is absolutely attached to the actual dna so we carry that historical trauma we carry the wisdom too but how do we get back in solidarity with ourselves and our healing to your point jonathan how do we bring ourselves back to wholeness so that we can love ourselves reflect that back to others and harm less right um and harm and heal help each other heal um this to your point too i've had a lot of my own deep contemplation about how were let's say i'm fourth generation japanese american i am the descendant of great grandparents grandparents parents who were incarcerated during world war ii and as i go back and find better language i think more accurate but different than the euphemisms of the government saying internment no that was mass incarceration and concentration camps let's call it what it was but even our immigration the way we were lied to and then brought here as migrant workers and farm labor that's actually social control yeah. the way we were hired and worked in the fields and then we figured out how to put land in our children's names we were incarcerated to get us off the land we weren't that actually that much of a threat mm. uh you know for the war so the land was stolen again so if we get real about that and start to name things and and like like see how japanese americans were used as tools for white supremacy then i can start to unravel uh like you were saying jonathan about being the anti-blackness i can start to unravel my own internalized impression and how i'm anti yep, yep. indigenous you know i start to and then i can no longer speak about the incarceration the concentration camps what so there's no uh then then i abolish all of the what we used to call like oppression olympics because now when i speak about mass incarceration <laughs> I speak about it without going back to first contact and colonization i can't and genocidal warfare i cannot speak about it without people who were forcibly removed kidnapped and enslaved social control with all the norms we have now around enslavement and now the mass incarceration of black and brown peoples today mm. so one of my i think some of this has finally come to fruition as you we all like you said evolved because my mentor yuri kochiyama always told me be a bridge builder but she also implored me you will never be an effective activist unless you actually learn the liberation movements of other peoples other oppressed peoples so then you'll have an idea of what the black community is fighting for what the latinx community is fighting for what the indigenous native community is fighting for and that went a long way to me developing and still developing i'm not perfect how to be empathetic compassionate yeah. and have that reflection that con deep connection all those connections to how that was a progression in history i think is helping me figure out something about how i can be in solidarity sorry that was a long explanation <laughs> no it was important it was important to acknowledge like you said the oppression olympics because we can go on a huge tandem conversation mm -hmm. of who had it worse and i think it's important to see and jonathan i love your your all of your metaphors, just being in a cocoon yeah. and healing oneself and really looking at internally at the growth and it's ugly sometimes. And it is, there are stages when you're coming together yeah. in solidarity for movements. A lot of times mm -hmm. it is so easy to get caught up in seeing that you are a victim of a system that is built to keep you in your place or it is meant to keep you down and benefit one particular group fit more favorably and so it's hard to move past the anger without acknowledging it and i and i think even too for armando saying you know really caring for one another and not hurting the other and hurting ourselves we need to be extremely kind to ourselves in this growth and extremely yeah. compassionate because it's so especially for bipoc people we were just joking about this but um thinking about other people or like being the you know wanting to sit in the back of the car not wanting to be first in line not wanting to you know we're always thinking community first before the individual and at least for even for the law for kanaka maori it's our community is always there in conversation like oh is this going to benefit our, our our whole ohana first you know for the for our little units and thinking in that realm of 
how we can really move through those stages and be really compassionate to us and then yeah. compassionate to those who also might be going through their own stages because it's so easy for us to say hey you can't say that to somebody because that's wrong or you're being problematic or you're being this and that and how are we contributing and at the same time how can i help you in your journey whether it's just sitting with you and allowing you to move through the grief that you might be experiencing when you come to the realization of all the things that have happened and the traumas that have happened to your line to who you are in your community and even to the traumas around you we're extremely extremely empathetic people and so when we see mm -hmm. our our brothers and sisters and cousins hurting through Black Lives Matter movements, you better believe I'm having an, a an emotional response. And I'm sure yeah. that's being echoed across the world. Um, and it's not to say that we all wanna be emotional, or we all wanna be angry or anything. It's, we feel it, and so now, how can we be better allies and be better supports for one another through this growth? And I really and, wanna say it that way. Also taking the time to, to um, search those feelings and, and the, the emotional responses that you have mm -hmm when this happens. Um, uh, Jonathan, I wanna also thank you for the for the cocoon thing. You are coming up with some gold. I am so glad that you're on this call. And I knew there was a reason why I wore this shirt because coming into a butterfly, I'm feeling like a butterfly. And let me explain a little bit about my cocoon phases and butterfly phases. I am, <laughs> I am native Hawaiian and I am black. And I have, I've had the, the, um, the, the, the privilege, I guess, the, the, it was a blessing to have lived through and be living through two very powerful movements that are shaping me in different ways and allowing me to become a butterfly. Mm. But the movements were very different. Now, the first one, of course, Antio Hoku talked about the Kapu Aloha movement that took place on the Mauna, which was a beautiful, beautiful time when our people stood together in Kapu Aloha, which is um, just no matter what, you will have aloha. It will be peaceful. There is no violence. There is no, we come together in love and that is something that needed to happen and it was so beautiful. And then what happened? The Black Lives um, Movement happened or it had been happening, but it really started to, to, to um, take off when, when um, after George, George Floyd passed away, died. And the, the feeling, first of all, that was a time for me to go through cocooning twice. And it's a very vulnerable time when we're in these cocoons, like you said, Jonathan. And the sensitivity to recognize when you're going through your cocoon and when someone else needs to go through their cocoon so that you can be sensitive yeah. to them while they're in that vulnerable time. Because what ended up happening to a small degree, there was a certain amount of, um, I guess, judgment that be, you know, when the Kapu Aloha movement happened, it was beautiful and peaceful. And then when the Black Lives Movement happened, there was violence that ensued and that was judged. And I was caught in the middle when I'm supposed to be going through my cocooning phase. I had to sort of respond to people and let them know, you know, what was going on and how your cocooning phase happened, stage, allow this hap to happen to me so that we, I can become a butterfly and recognizing that because there were two very different things. And you, we, need to, we need to recognize that and allow people space to, like you said, be vulnerable. And it's also, it's also a question around like only, I mean, I think, I think the complexity of, the, uh, of, of, of allowing for people to show up in their dynamism, right? Um, I, think, I think that that is also creating space for solidarity. Um, we live in a country and in a society that's constructed off a of binary and everything is queer No matter what no matter how we might think of it. Everything is queer that Na nature is a queering Concept in its natural form, but yet we try to rule it as man to say X Y and Z and when even being human is more complex than the way that the constructs of society um, kind of relegate us to be in and so like a question that I, I that like i've been sitting with listening to this beautiful conversation was that what is the space what is the space of creating solidarity and is this and, and that allows for someone might be considered the oppressor the space to have solidarity to find their tranquility their peace their healing um what is the capacity for that that's just what something that just came in my mind because it's it's one thing to talk to the converted 
and create space for the converted to be more deeply converted. Because again, as Leslie, as she, as you said so beautifully, we are all works in progress, and the progress, and I, and I, and 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 we're all there. Yet there are people who are have more dissonance <laughs> to the spaces in which we are hoping society to lean into. And how do we create space for them? What does the solidarity path look like for them? Um, how do we not deem that as a waste of time? Also, how does it not suck up our time? These are multiple things that it's like sitting with as I listen to this beautiful conversation unravel. Yeah, if I can have my chance at picking up your your uh, cocooning metaphor, <laughs> I love it. So giving. Um, we're really we're inviting people to search within themselves, right? I, I believe yeah. uh, when you were saying that, I believe that the space is within each of us. And um, I'll share just really briefly, like my family has a complicated immigration story. My grandfather was deported when I was in college. Uh, my last name is native indigenous to Michoacan. That's Gurepecha, it means honey collector. Um, but I don't have a lot of the culture from the, the tribe because of how uh, the caste system in Latin America works and sort of like the priorities of my great grandparents and grandparents and just down the line. Um, how we ended up in this country, how I'm speaking this language this fluently and have mm -hmm. been able to occupy the spaces that I have. And that's my journey. And I share that for whatever learnings that it might bring up in other people. But it it isn't like, I'll, say, I'll speak for myself. Like I'm not asking for like pity or like people to feel sorry for me. Like what I need people to do is like find their own story because we're all subject to racism. We're all, we're all dehumanized by the white supremacy culture that we're navigating. And that's my journey. And I need people to find theirs. That's- Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, you're all reminding me, I learned this probably two, well, maybe three or four years ago now, that as I look at demographic changes and how we make space for each other uh, and, and f finding our stories, and then your your piece, uh, Maki Ile, reminds me of this. Um, it was a, about three years ago, so I think we have about four years. It was predicted that with demographic changes, humans in the U.S. 35 and under will be majority mixed race. Mm -hmm. And already in the Asian Pan Asian community, um, I can speak specifically to the Japanese community. We are more than 50% mixed race. We have been for some time. We might be up to like 70, 75% mixed race with our generation set since I'm, I'm Yonsei going forward. Go say on, on the, into the younger generation. So, so as we make space for others, each other, and we're more mixed, that idea of calling in that the complexity that's needed, not the binary, like you're saying, the complexity is already happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. Compassion, yeah. empathy for not making our, our, our friends, our cousins, our family choose who they should be one way or the other, but they're whole and they're beautifully complex and they can own all parts of themselves. That, that enters into, for me, to solidarity. And Jonathan, you mentioned in our last call to the vulnerability yeah. And you've mentioned it today a little bit, that vulnerable place. What about the creating a vulnerable place? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, the, oh, no, I see someone else leaning in. I can be quiet. Oh, no one else is leaning in? Okay, mm -hmm. what I was going to say really quickly about vulnerability um, mm -hmm. is that is that uh, vulnerability is a muscle that society has not known as a dominant force for creation. Um, society has known muscle as the dominant force for its creation. And as one of my beautiful residents uh, for my director residency program, Dominique Ryder said, is that we have built empires, not homes. And that by building, not, by building empires, we have dominated, conquered, and we have ruled. And we have not created homes, meaning that we have actually allowed, as Shade Litkat from MBT says always, is where your best exhale can be. We haven't learned what an exhale, where an exhale can feel like. And so because we haven't learned what an exhale is, and because we build empires, not homes, we are rapidly taking and chipping away at our humanity for what purpose? 
And so this moment of solidarity quickens and and racks at and shifts at the foundation of our security and Mm -hmm. says that what you thought was strong is actually the weakest point inside of your existence. And that existence is fabricated off of centuries and years of a lie. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. How do you sit with that knowingness? And then when you realize the depth and time of that blood memory, as you were talking about, Leslie, that lives inside of the fabrication of your being, then you also start to realize that you are a student to the revolution, right? That you are not gonna be able to necessarily generate the revolution in your lifetime, yet you can build the bridgeways and pathways for a revolution to know itself in this life. Mm -hmm. That's so true, that just made me think about with everything that you're saying, Jonathan, it made me think about my own journeys as a young adult where I thought at 30 by now, I'd have a huge house and a horse and (laughs) not that that means anything. But you know, you have this thing where this propagated idea that you have to be independent, you have to have all your ducks in a row, you have to have paid off your school debt, have four degrees, have a whole family, make six figures a year, pay it all by yourself, and then you can get somebody in to help you with that. And if anything, through my life, having this new blended modern ohana, it's it's very much you need to look at your life. It's not about being all alone. You know, although that's what society is striving us to do is just be alone. Be okay with being alone. Be okay with being independent and doing things by yourself or else you're weak or else you're not fit to exist in society today. And I think that's completely backwards because our BIPOC and our our indigenous societies were all about coming together and what projects and not just projects, but the work of bringing people together for things for each other. And and the connections and the relying on each other was not demonized at all. Mm -hmm. It was very, it made sense. We specialized in things. If I didn't know how to carve a canoe, I'm not gonna carve a canoe. I'm gonna Mm -hmm. go to the canoe carver, but I have special skills and attributes that I could, I could, give them in return and reciprocate this reciprocity is something and we're each adding our own take because it's it's hard in in movements like these coming together in solidarity like monarchia everyone said you have to go to the mona you have to do this way you have to go this way and that way of standing in solidarity was not for everyone not every like for myself working for my family i couldn't just up and leave to the to the mona when everyone else went and I wanted to, my whole being wanted to go, but I had to be here for my ohana. I did get to go at, at a later point, but knowing that so beautifully Armando said, finding your story and finding your journey is important in being able to stand with others. You gotta know who you are, not as just mm-hmm. an individual by themselves. You gotta know who you are and where your line is so that you can stand with others amongst you as well. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. This is also beautiful. I, I also want to make sure I'm keeping time here um, because I know some of our guests will need to go right on the hour and then Moses, you and I will continue with our last announcements and things. So Moses, do you think it's that time? I, and I'm just going to pledge this will not be the last time that we all have a conversation. I love our conversation. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it is that time, Leslie. Thank you. I was getting so caught up in this incredible conversation. <laughs> so we got to wrap things up. So, um, well, we, uh, I'm just gonna just put it out there. If if the the three of our guests would would like to say a few final thoughts or words, whatever that may be, we would love for you to just take take a moment and just say one final thing. And um, yeah, or not. I don't know. I can go really quickly. I, I think we all do. I think we're just really polite with each other. And yeah. so therefore, with, with, with politeness creates a kind of, can create silence. So I will say, I will say that um, a lasting word that I will say is that um, love, uh, it's, a, it's actually the title of a show that I'm creating at NYU, but I, the way when I think of solidarity, um, love is the message, joy is the revival. Um, that that through love we find the messages that we need to actually create potentially solidarity. 
But in the revival of who we are, what we're reviving is a dead potential system that could actually center joy. And that through joy as an elixir, we can find some new possibilities. So I just want to leave that as a lasting word. Lasting word I'd like to share is kupa. Just keep it going steady. And even though when it gets really hard and you get those headbutt moments where it feels like, I don't know how I'm even going to take another step forward. Just kupa'a, ho'omau, keep going and know that even if you can't see, there are many of those around you that have been there before and those who will come after you, who will carry you through through all of that. So e kupa'a. Mm. Oh man, how, how to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone first. No, um, I'll just like, I don't know, like what's been helping me through this time and, and might help others is like, make sure you're spending time with your heart people and um take care of yourself you know we're all we're all lifting this up together so take the time that you need when you need it Ashe. wow and, and moses do you have a thought um you know my my thought is just uh just continue to have these conversations i know that i am excited to um get to know armando and jonathan better i know makile she's, she's my friend i know a long time but but on this call right now is, is, is just an amazing bunch of people. And I look forward to becoming um, a part of your lives and you will become a part of my lives whether you want it or not, because I think <laughs> we, have, we have some more things to talk about. So this mahalo to you. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I'll say some thank yous. And then if we can invite our, our viewers to breathe with us as we breathed in, we'll, we'll breathe again together. And then Moses, you and I will do some announcements. Uh, as they go off into their uh, next thing. Uh, so, oh my goodness, mahalo, arigatou gozaimasu, gunashish, as the Klinkit people say, to chinangeli, as the Danaina people say. Grateful to be here in on their land. Um, just thank you from the bottom of my heart. It means the world that you joined us today and shared your wisdom and your lived experience. Uh, these esteemed guests, everybody, you can go to this uh, return to the source. You see it on the screen there to download the program and you can see their incredible and what they bring to the world. And you got to hear a bit today about what they continue to bring to our communities. And um, I just can't say enough for each of you. Uh, lots of love. Please be safe. And also just know I'm going to be I'll be, I'll be back with you. <laughs> you know, I'll be typing, I'll be calling you, I'll be Zooming you. We got more work to do together. So yes, yes. So with that, can we all invite our viewers too, but take a breath together for yourself first. So you're replenishing yourself. Yes. And as mentioned, that exhale is critical to your healing, to your grounding. And another breath in for all those who viewed and for this group that this is gathering today. <sighs> yes, and the exhale completely. And three is always a wonderful number. So in one more breath for the communities that we serve, each in our networks, but also individually in our, in our lives, our families, our cousins, our communities. And it exhale completely. Thank you so much to our guests for being with us. And we thank uh, Maximiliano and Ariel backstage that will have them now go off very elegantly. Thank you. And then uh, Moses, you and I get to offer more thanks and gratitude and some announcements. Yes, yeah, first we will mahalo. 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 for being a part of this discussion as well, even though she wasn't actually here on the call, her video yeah. was, was, was certainly helped to, to ground us as we entered into this conversation. Yeah, now you. we have to mahalo our, our yeah. funders and partners, and I'm going to start with the Ford Foundation, mahalo to them, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, National Endowment of the Arts, Howl Round Theater Commons, NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts. Yes, and it's my honor and pleasure to also thank the Queen Liliuokalani Trust 
the T-Shirt Theater, TETA Productions, Theater Communications Group, and University of Hawaii Manoa. And uh, just a quick shout out uh, for the University of, of Hawaii Manoa. They're undergoing some real struggles. They're looking at being cut, their programs being cut. So please, please go to our uh, Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists Facebook page where you can learn more and you will find ways to help. University of Hawaii Manoa. Yeah, Thank you. Yes. Right. We'd also like to remind you, if you are not a COTA board member, now's your time to do so. Become a, uh, I'm not a board member, but, but a, a member of COTA, excuse me. Um, now's your time to do that. We have, um, we encourage that. If you are not an active member and you were a member, please become a member of COTA and be a part of this beautiful family. Yes. And Moses, I think I understand that they can even just scan that, that image oh, yeah, right, 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 now, there. right there, right? Technology, look at that. They can scan away. Beautiful. And uh, I'm also um, uh, excited to share with you that, you know, during these difficult times, I'm excited that so many have already donated or supported Kata. And um, so if you're inclined, please do uh, donate. Your, uh, your contribution helps us sustain so that we can uh, support our Pan-Asian, MENA, uh, Native Indigenous, and um, our Pacific Islander communities and artists. So thank you, that helps us to continue our work with the Confess and our other programming, once again, that support our artists. So thank you for those who are giving, but also uh, if you don't mind sharing out to others who might be able to donate, we would deeply appreciate that. Yeah. And don't forget that this is a monthly series. So every month we will have an episode and coming up next month, October 12th, uh, we have the next installment, which is titled Artists on the Frontline, Creativity and Change During COVID-19, moderated by Kata board member and CONFES Steering Com uh, Committee co-chair, Leilani Chan. Um, so tune in for that. That is October 12th. And also, we just want to send uh, another special mahalo out to HowlRound for being an amazing partner in this series. Beautiful. And uh, once again, our COTA Confest 2021 is postponed till May, uh, as you see the dates there, 21 through 30th. But also know we are invested in monitoring this pandemic situation to make sure our communities, any of you who might want to register or participate, we're looking out for your safety, your health. So we will mon uh, monitor the situation and we'll stay tuned because we'll have communications but that's our intention is to be able to come back together in may 2021 so in the meantime of course please wear your masks please socially distance uh, to help keep each other safe and i want to also give a shout out to a special project that these national bipoc networks of color have come together as i mentioned in coalition and we have designed a bipoc survey some of you may know about it already, but we want to make sure you know we're continuing to keep that available for folks to fill out, practitioners, those who work inside theaters of color, those who also work inside of predominantly white organizations. We want to have you be able to designate that on a survey and share with us your experience because we want to monitor how COVID is impacting you all. Uh, so please, I believe we're going to have a slide about that. Um, so you'll see that there are some links um, so you can fill out the survey. Please do spread the word on that. That data will help us and your anecdotal um, you know, um, sharing on that survey will help us to create sustainability for our communities in solidarity in coalition with these BIPOC networks of color. And so thank you for joining us. From, from me, it's meaningful, but I wanna pass the baton for you, Moses, to have the last word. Well, just like that, we are at the end of our program, but don't leave yet because we have something really special. We are going to end with another piece that was created by Maki Ile Ishihara, who we just saw as one of our panelists. She created a piece called Pono. Um, we, we created it together, but really she took the lead and just made this thing something beautiful. 
It features another uh, um, artist friend of ours, Loko Mai Kai Lipscomb, that you will see in this video. And it's entitled Pono. And Pono, for those of you who don't know, speaks of a balance that we all uh, strive to achieve in our daily lives as we interact with our environment around us and as we stand in solidarity. So we're going to play um, Makile's piece called Pono. Enjoy the video. Mahalo. Pono is a dance. Pono is maluhia. Pono is ikaika. Pono is a song. Pono is green. Pono is warm. How do I find Pono? Is it something I can see? Like a manu high up in the sky or a mano in the deep? Pono is makanahele. Pono is mali. How do I find Pono? Is it something I can be? Strong and tall like a kumu'ulu Or is it something I should choose? Pono is loko maika'i Pono is hau'oli Pono is kind Pono is justice Pono is Pono is my pico, my na'o and my kino. It's listening to what my makua say, taking the time to go and play. Remember my kupuna before me. Pono's being a kia'i. Opale kana those around me It's lending a helping hand Malama I know with my friends It's knowing when to say I'm sorry Pono is necessary To holo mua and never know things if my future path is right or wrong, if the way ahead is short or long, it's getting up right after falling. Pono is a space for all. Heao nani. Paying it forward. Pono is manavana pakaka. Eha. Pono is aloha. Holomua. Kupa. Pono is a movement. 